This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 893, recorded on April 22nd, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, everybody. Hello, Vincent. And um, just briefly noted, it's the best day of the year so far. And I said that last time. So I <laughs> really mean it because it's, it, this day is even better than last week's day on uh, Friday. Um, it's as clear as a bell. There's no wind. The temperature here is about 72. And um, magna- happy Earth Day, by the way, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. It is equally beautiful here. 68 Fahrenheit, 20 Celsius, sunny. Um, seems like a great start to the weekend. Well, you know, Dixon, it can't help but just get better from now on, right? Well, that's what you think, but Happy Earth Day has a way of <laughs> biting yeah. us in the butt. And, uh, Today, yeah. Uh, these days don't Today, come that often. That's all I'm saying. You know, there'll be nice ones too, uh, but you nice. don't want you don't want the really hot, humid days. That's what you're saying. Right? No, you don't I like don't. That. Nor, nor do I want the um, the boredom of living in San Diego, because yeah. my, my sister lived there for three years with her husband, who was in the Navy, and all they talked about was how nice the weather was. They never had a bad day. So I think that yeah. can be boring after a while. Seventy two and sunny. Today, we have a trio of guests for you who uh, work at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx, not too far from us. And uh, joining us today, Kartik Chandran, coming back for multiple twivs. Welcome back, Kartik. Thanks, Vincent. Happy to be on again. Kartik has always appreciated the value of podcasting, right? Science podcasting. Yes, absolutely. And I, I, you know, there are some who do and scientists and some who don't get it. <laughs> like, why are you doing this? Why don't you write grants and do experiments? You know? Yeah. Well, but, my uh, wife who loves science, but who's not a science working scientist absolutely loves to have. And so she's actually way more up on it than I am usually. So wonderful. And now she will really like your episode. So, I hope so. or maybe not, who knows? Maybe right? not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, also joining us. Uh, from Albert Einstein. Actually, she's not there today, but uh, she's elsewhere in the world. Denise Hasselwanter, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us today. It's a pleasure. Now, and I want to add the weather here is amazing too. So, <laughs> in, in Colombia, you're in Colombia, South yeah, America, right? Exactly. Wow. Is it really beautiful? It is. It's like forever spring or summer. Nice. So Vincent's so you, at Columbia, Columbia with a U, and you're at Columbia with a no. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Very good, Dixon. That's right. <laughs> and also joining us uh, from the Bronx, Gorka Lasso Cabrera. Welcome, Gorka. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Pleasure to be here as well. Yeah. Uh, we've never met, right? I know I've never met Denise, but I never met you either, Gorka, right? No, we haven't met. Yeah, first time. Uh, I, I'm, Hopefully I, not the last. No, uh, I've I've been in Kartik's lab a couple of times. I think usually because I'm teaching in your virology course, right? Yeah. And I came up once and, and someone had a little fluffy thing of Ebola virus, remember? That was a long time ago, yeah. That was yeah. a long time ago. I think ago. we still have that somewhere. But, <laughs> um, right. Yeah. Well, I think was at Columbia, so... Yeah, I'm sure I'll, I'll tell you about it shortly. Okay, so yeah. let's, yeah. let's hear. So Kartik, we know... Uh, all about his history, and you can go back to one of the earlier TWIVs. I think the last one was the Prometheus Project TWIV, right? Yep. Which for me was a, a challenge because we had a lot of people, yeah, and um, it was a challenge to set up the table. And I, I just had enough microphones for everybody. That's right. It was, fun. it was it was fun. It was I a lot of fun. fun yeah. I had a lot of fun, and mm-hmm. the the episode was really good. And kind of presaged what's going on in terms yeah. of therapeutic monoclonals, right? Yes. Very cool. You're you're a forward looking guy, Karthik, because uh Yeah, just purely by accident, yeah. 
That's yeah, so that expression science. of uh, even a stop clock tells the right time twice a day. <laughs> That's good. I like that. So uh, let's find out about uh, our two other guests. Denise, give us a little bit of your history, please. Sure. So I'm, I'm Denise. I'm originally from Austria and I did my PhD in Vienna on viruses in the lab of Professor Franz Heinz and Karin Stiasny. So I was uh, working a lot on tick-borne encephalitis virus. Yeah, yeah. So that's my background. And then I applied to Cardix lab because I wanted to work on emerging viruses. And I was lucky and started there as a postdoc. And then yellow fever became my, my big project for like three years almost. FX Heinz, I know him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Flavy virus guy. Now, um... Are you finished with your postdoc? Are you going back to Austria now? Yes. So I, I finished uh -huh. like a month ago and now I'm taking a break and then I'm going to start my new job back in Austria. Being closer yeah. to family, it's like yeah. the trip across the ocean is very far. True. Are you, uh, are you a good skier? <laughs> <laughs> no. Are you a good skier? Oh, yeah. No, I think it's... <laughs> Everybody it's in Austria like, is born in skiing. <laughs> yeah, that's what we do. Like my, my little brother started skiing with three. It's more like you, we push them down the mountain and you're going to figure it out. Yeah. Right, right. So my thesis advisor, Peter Palazzi, was from Austria. Oh, yeah. And he's a fantastic skier. And I was at a meeting, I think it was at Lake Tahoe once, and we were skiing. And then... <laughs> At one point, he says to me, Vincent, I'm going with the big boys now. You go with my wife. Ski with my <laughs> wife. <laughs> and she was she was much better than I, I was. I am. But uh, he, he, he went off with people who were just so good, including him. Oh, man. It's, it helps when you ski from a young age, right? That's the key. I didn't. I didn't no. at all. So, Gorka, what's your history? Yeah, because then you're not scared. Oh. Yes, that's right. right sorry. Yeah, um, well, I'm from the north of Spain, from a city called Bilbao, in the Atlantic corner between France and Spain. And uh, I did my bachelor's in University of Navarra uh, in biochemistry, but then I moved to University of Wales, Swansea, to do a PhD in computational biology on membrane proteins. From there, I went back to, I w I went back to my hometown, to Bilbao, to do a postdoc in cryo microscopy on metabolic enzymes. And, uh, and then I was also working on P53, the tumor suppressor, and that was the connection to come to New York. And I worked with Barry Honig. And eventually I, I moved from uh, P53 to uh, viruses. And that's how I interacted with uh, Kartik Chandran, um, working on Ebola viruses. And so that's the connection. And now I'm working at Cartix uh, as a research assistant professor. So we and never. We're not going to ask uh, you if you're good at skiing. Yeah, I, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I learned later. Yeah, so not, not as good as Denise. But I saw Gorka skiing. He's from, good. Okay, mm -hmm. I go down. I go down. down, <laughs> go down so, so I've been to Bilbao. My wife and I yeah. took a trip along the Pyrenees and we ended up there and uh, we went to the museum, the Frank Gehry Museum. Yeah. And it was one of our biggest disappointments because the outside of this museum is fabulous. It's just the most unusual arrangement of titanium plates that actually yes. compose that museum. But right. when we got inside, there was nothing, I wouldn't say there's nothing worth seeing, but the museum was not constructed to be a museum. It was constructed to be a Frank Gehry edifice. I don't know if you feel the same way, but we um, we loved the town, though. The Bilbao town was, was quite charming and quite yeah. beautiful. But yeah. the museum itself was, that left a few um, little... Underwhelming. It, it yeah, has, underwhelming is a good word. Yeah, that's a very good word. The Talk, museum is... Like a, it's, yeah, it's, a good word. yeah it's, it's a very interesting uh, building. It's actually based on the shape of the of boats. I don't know if you yes. know this. But yes, no, yeah. no, no, no. We got um, the whole deal. But, uh, yeah. And then we started to see the rust spots. You know, the, the, the titanium didn't actually hold up so well. So they had to redo the whole thing. And it's, yeah. it was, a, but it was still worth a drive. We 
we enjoyed seeing it. No, no question about it. I guess now we have our own Gary buildings in New York, right? Yes, we do. And we have that funny one that we're every... The glass all, building on yeah, 18th yeah. Street. That's yeah, right. it's all it's all twisted, right? Going right. Up. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, I see that every day on my way to work. I look, know architects refer to that as an edifice complex. <laughs> <laughs> it's so expensive. I looked at it just out of curiosity. It's very expensive. It's like, like you want a studio on the top floor. It's like $30,000 a month. It's ridiculous. It. Whoa. Only Kartik could afford that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Gorka, I've been to Swansea. In December, in December uh, for a meeting at the university. Oh my gosh, what a miserable place in December. Yeah, when was that? Oh, a long time ago. I was at a virus meeting. I don't even remember what the topic was, but um, uh, we were staying in the dormitories and we were so cold, we were poorly heated. Cold. The sheets were very thin and the bathroom was down, the shower was down the hall. You had to. Walk in the cold. Oh my gosh, it was so freezing. And then for breakfast, they had sardines. And I said, oh my gosh, I have to go home. <laughs> I can't handle this. Anyway, I never saw you at Columbia, right? Never ran uh, into it. No, we never. I was at the medical campus um, mm -hmm. with that's Barry Honig. So that's, yeah, we never. That's where, uh, I am. that's where I am. I'm at the medical campus and I know right. Barry. He's across the street. I'm I'm in the Hammer building and you were in black yeah. probably, right? Yeah. No, I was in the ICRC. ICRC, Okay. Even further away, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but all it takes is to be across the street and you never see anybody. I mean, I saw true, yesterday yeah. I was at a meeting and That's I heard true. Tom Tom Maniatis give a talk, right? Tom oh, Maniatis really? has been in the biochemistry department at Columbia for five years. I have never spoken a word to him because he's across the street. It happens. Oh, well. Anyway, let's talk a about big our- campus. Yeah, it's a big campus. But everybody's wrapped up in their own thing. Let's talk about uh, your paper, which I read some weeks ago. And I said, oh, let's get Kartik on. And then we ended up doing uh, another one of your papers independently, the hantavirus monoclonals, uh, which was just coincidental. So this is cell, cell host and microbe. Genotype-specific features reduce the susceptibility of South American yellow fever virus strains to vaccine-induced antibodies. So um, my... my um, so Amy, who is my associate, and she has um, found cross that enteroviruses, which are very numerous, cr actually, if you make antibodies to them, they cross react. So um, there's and there's also antigenic drift, and all of these things no one knew about because they never looked for them. And this, so that the drift here is what uh, caught my attention. So is this? Um, oh, by the way, one of the authors is Esper Callis from Brazil, who he's been on Twiv. Did you know that? Uh, Kartik? Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, I, during, think I listened to that one. Th during the Zika uh, outbreak, yeah. he was, yeah. uh, he was on and uh, I actually, let's see, I was, I was going to meet him there when I went and we never could hook up together. He's such a nice guy. Very. very I never nice met guy. him. And none of us have met him uh, in person. Yeah. Um, so is this part of the Prometheus project, Kartik? No. Um, it's not. It's uh, an independent project that, um, you know, I guess we'll talk about the, the genesis of it. But yeah, um, yeah it, okay. It, but some of the cast of characters, like Laura Walker. Yeah, I saw Laura are there, there. Yeah, are, yeah. Are, are okay. Also in Prometheus. So Denise and Gorka are um, f the first and second authors here, right? Um, and uh, you, Kartik, of course, is at the end, and a lot of people from Brazil, right? Uh, Kartik. Yeah, I mean, so, they, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, so, I, I mean, I, I thought this would be interesting because we can explore yellow fever and it's not something we talk about much. So uh, how did this come about, this project? Tell us that. Yeah, I think, Denise, you should, you should, because uh, it's all started with Denise. You know, Denise came okay. to my lab and she, you know, we weren't doing anything with Flavies. Um, and, uh, you know, Denise, like, can I work on Flaviviruses? And, and the way that this sort of unfolded was kind of just organic, um, and that maybe Denise, you could just start by telling um, everybody about the first project and then how that led into the second sure. one. So, so we had already uh, this collaboration with Laura Walker and Anavec. They were working on yellow fever monoclonal antibodies, and we got some of them for testing, like doing utilization assays. And then it was about okay, what could we do more with those antibodies? And see, the Zika outbreak was not long ago. 
And there was also this difference between the Zika strains from Asia and Africa. And then I was just checking up yellow fever and I saw there was an outbreak. But however, we could not have the actual um, South American yellow fever strain in the lab because we didn't have a PSR3 lab. So what I did, I generated reporter virus particles, like they're very commonly used for, um, for flaviviruses. So I basically designed them for the Brazilian strain where this outbreak happened and tested these antibodies. And the weird thing is it didn't work. And I kind of believed that my assay is not working. And then what happened, we had a conversation with Laura and then we realized that our big collaborator in this um, paper, Muna Bonaldo, she actually found something similar. So she used the authentic um, Brazilian virus strain in her lab and she also found this huge loss of neutralization. And then kind of, we tried to figure out what's happening. We I mean, just started out basically, yeah. Yeah, and then that's where Gorka came in and helped us with the structure work and so on. I mean, the, the way this started, it was really just, you know, Laura and Anna Weck, who was actually, you know, incidentally, Anna is a former student in my lab, a PhD student, and um, she went on to do a work with uh, Laura Walker at Adimath. Um, and so she was leading this on that side. And, um, you know, essentially, we were just helping characterize this slew of monoclonal antibodies that they'd isolated from uh, people in New Hampshire that that collaborated with Dartmouth and they immunized naive people with um, the yellow fever vaccine. And then John, you know, it was really an immunological study doing longitudinal sampling of these people looking at B cells and the antibodies that were generated. And we were sort of, you know, we were, you know, helping with the virology component of that and looking at neutralization. I think it was, you know, Denise's sort of, you know, inside, I think that, you know, uh, we're looking at uh, all of the studies we've done were really with the vaccine strain, right? Which is the same strain these people had gotten. Yeah. Um, but, you know, these are not the circulating strains, right? And so what happens when you look at circulating strains uh, in terms of the glycoprotein that's on the surface of these particles? You know, does it look different if we look at circulating African strains? Does it look different if we look at circulating South American strains? And, you know, Denise immediately observed these differences in neutralization with some of the antibodies. And that was, you know, many of the antibodies still cross neutralized, but there was a class of these antibodies that seemed not to work very well against the South American strains. Yeah, but uh, and this that's class was also what really the, kind of got us main, yes. I mean, the class we characterized Sorry, was also yeah. the, the main class of typical antibodies elicited yeah. by the vaccine strain and all of them did not work. Like it was a, a huge portion of the antibodies yeah. we screened. So what, what, um, why did you tell us about this outbreak in, in, uh, Brazil? So you say the 2016, 2019 epidemic, I mean, why was there an outbreak? What's the, Dixon was kind of talking about this uh, earlier, but what was the driver for that? Do we know? I don't think it's really known, but I would say it's mostly because the deforestation climate change that the mosquitoes slowly left the Amazonas and went down to the big cities. And then, of course, the the vaccination rate there was probably low. And also, interestingly, what I found was that a lot of monkeys got sick. Like, it was really um, transmitted very quickly. So the, uh, the, uh, the well, other issue the is... The destruction of forest by fire over the last five years in Brazil. Yeah. Which has uh, displaced millions of wildlife and... Um, reoriented where the mosquitoes are found and and people move into those areas because they've been cleared by nature so they can start farming or gold mining mm -hmm. and this just really ties together the epidemiology of yellow fever right so normally you so so there is a cycle of yellow fever among the non-human primates right correct and, and occasionally uh they can then spill over into people and then people can transmit it to each other, right? They're different kinds of cycles. What is well, the mosquito it, it that depends on two different mosquitoes? What are they? What are the two mosquitoes? The, the first mosquito is called a hemagogus mosquito. And okay. it's a it only bites mos monkeys. Okay. And the monkeys live in the canopy and that's where this cycle takes place and nobody gets hurt. There's no people. But once you clear an area for settling, 
or for farming, and people and monkeys can now interact. There's this uh, zone where they they're not afraid to go anymore because it's it's a narrow zone between the the jungle or the forest and the garbage pits that are created by human civilization. And they run across these little zones, grab some food or whatever you want to call that, and then run back into the forest. Well, when they do, the 80s Egypti mosquitoes, which are sitting there biting the hell out of people, but they don't have any yellow fever, all of a sudden they pick up yellow fever from the monkeys, and now they can give it to people. Okay. So that it jumps out of the um, canopy, down onto the ground, and then into the into the urban centers. Uh, um, I, I do believe that hemogogous mos mosquitoes can feed on humans and spread the, vi uh, the virus as well. I mean, this is also true for some alpha viruses. So, oh, okay. I, I've had an older yeah. course in medical entomology <laughs> that dates back to the 1960s. I stand corrected yeah. or sit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's complicated, but, you know, there there, there is, I think, a lot of evidence that you know, that, that a lot of what happened in this more recent outbreak, you know, was, wasn't necessarily like a highly active urban cycle, but really people coming into contact, you know, you know, it's what, like, like rubber plantation workers and people yeah, like that, yeah, that yeah, are yeah, kind yeah, of on the yeah. edge of the forest That's uh, right. of, of the Amazon. They do come into contact with the same mosquitoes that feed on non-human primates. Sure. Um, and then okay. there might be some amplification through Aedes aegypti as well. No, the, the Aedes aegypti mosquito will feed on both primates, non-primate right. primates and humans. Right. But I don't think the hemogongus, because it doesn't even mm -hmm. live where people are, they they breed in uh, tree holes and stuff like that way up in the canopy. Right. Right. So one of the things you say in the paper, yeah. Denise, is that... We need to get a mosquito expert on too, which I'm not... Uh, Denise, you're right that there's a, there was also vaccine shortages in Brazil that contributed yeah. to this outbreak which is similar like what happens in africa like there's a shortage oh, denise, yeah. is frozen. She's frozen. Yeah, denise, denise is frozen oh maybe she'll become unfrozen i can hear you i mean i, I can try and uh, uh, so i i think it, it's it's hard to parse sort of like this issue of vaccine availability i mean i think this is certainly the case that there isn't enough vaccine to go around globally mm -hmm. and this is one of the reasons why the who is really kind of trying to, they have this new campaign called EYE, uh, End Yellow Fever Epidemics. And one of the sort of the linchpins of this is going to be, you know, vaccine manufacturing and vaccine distribution, because yeah. there isn't yeah. enough, um, for sure. Um, I, I think it's sort of a, you know, I, I you know, it's, it's a complicated issue to parse, but, you know, it is true that, you know, there was fractional dosing done to conserve ah, I see. vaccine, it's not clear if that contributed to anything, right? Like yeah. this is the problem. I mean, I think one of the challenges with this kind of work is that we can do the molecular biology in the lab relatively easily, but uh, understand, I mean, in the scheme of things, but then trying to understand what that means in terms of the, sure. the sort of the disease epidemiology, the vaccine effectiveness in the field. I mean, I, I feel like that's a much more difficult question um, to, to kind of unpack. Um, I was actually invited to be on a panel at a uh, field cruise um, in Rio de Janeiro and, you know, like where uh, Myrna Bonaldo is, our collaborator is there and she kind of invited me and there was a whole panel of people from that institute and we kind of had a really vigorous discussion. And of course, the, the, the sort of the, the organization um, that manufactures the, South, the vaccine in Brazil is affiliated with that institute. So for them, this is something very close to their hearts in terms of thinking about the, the vaccine. And I think there was, you know, based on our conversations, there was a, a sense, you know, that the vaccine worked just fine mm. and that there was no issue with the vaccine, that certainly more doses were needed and certainly certain people needed to be boosted uh, rather than just getting one shot for their whole life, which is sort of the has been the party line for a long time. Um, so I, I do think we need a lot more data to understand, um, you know, even just leaving aside this issue of T cells, right? Because we're yeah. only looking at antibodies. Yes, right, um, right. <laughs> you know, what does this actually mean in terms of vaccine mediated protection um, is, you know, a, an open question, I think. Yeah. And I don't, I'm not trying to be coy. I think that's just the limits of where we are in terms of the, the, the data. 
Yeah, um, I think that's that's absolutely fair conclusion. Yeah. Uh, so I actually have another question about something, and it's entirely possible that the answer is that there is not yet enough data uh, on it. Um, so you've mentioned a little bit about South African strains and about um, South American, South American yeah. strains mm-hmm. and African strains. Um, what was sort of known or thought about in terms of the genetic diversity between those strains um, and, you know, current versus historical mm-hmm. vaccine strains or, you know, yeah. did everyone say, no, this epidemic is totally because of deforestation and vaccine availability. There's no, nothing going on with genetics. Yeah. I, the answer is more complicated as always. So um, in fact, one of the key players in this one scientifically is our collaborator, Rena Bonaldo, and her group showed that the virus is associated. So there are multiple sort of genotypes and Gorka can maybe talk a little bit about the, the phylogenies here, but um, there are sort of what are called the modern strains. And, you know, there's a clade of kind of viruses um, and, you know, the, 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 the viruses that actually caused these bigger outbreaks, these recent outbreaks seem to have a lot of unique amino acid changes. Um, but the kicker is that none of those changes are in the spike, in the galactic protein. They're all in these non-structural proteins. So, you know, there is no evidence at present that those changes contribute to spread, contribute to virulence or anything. We don't, there's no functional data. All there is is genotypic the sequencing data saying that these non-structural protein sequence changes did are observed in this in this this recent clade of viruses that are associated with these outbreaks. Um, however, when we look at the sequence changes that we studied in this paper, they seem much more they seem much older, right? So they uh, are present in all of these this this new clades as well as the oldest sequences. Actually, Gorka, you should talk about just the, the sequencing because Gorka did all of the sort of the phylogenetic analysis for this paper. Yeah, so when um, Denise uh, came with this question, it's like, well, what are the residues that could be relevant for uh, in the envelope that can play a role in neutralization? So what, what we did was to get uh, hundreds of sequences from public repositories. And uh, we look for conserved amino acid changes, con- residues that would be, whose identity would be common amongst South American uh, strains, but not African strains. And that helped us uh, pinpointing certain residues that we thought uh, might be playing a role. But uh, I, on, on the envelope, just on the envelope, when we compare, um, the Brazilian strain that we were working with uh, and uh, the vaccine strains uh, and and African strains and also Chinese strain. Um, We had 23 amino acid changes. So we had to um, narrow down the search uh, because computationally it's very difficult to tell which of those will be playing a role. Uh, So uh, one one thing that Denise first did was to do domain swaps to identify those domains where in the envelope that might be playing a role. And then computationally, we were able to um, assess or at least rank those amino acid changes that we thought might be playing a role. Can I ask a question about the origins of yellow fever? Um, <clears throat> are you convinced that for 175 million years, South America and Africa both, as they started to split apart, um, had yellow fever at that point or not? <laughs> How old is it? And if it's older in one place than the other, doesn't that speak volumes to the development of the vaccine and its effectiveness? Uh, I mean, I think, um, I don't know that we could say, I mean, given how like, kind of shallow the viral phylogenies are, I'm not sure we could really say, you know, how, whether, you know, before the continent split, whether there was, there might've been some, there must've been some precursor virus. But I think what we do know is that modern yellow fever virus came to the Americas, um, most likely along with the European conquest and most likely as part of the slave trade from Africa. So it probably came with enslaved people and, um, and, and 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 so what we speculate we have absolutely no no evidence for this of course in the paper 
Um, we have been trying to, to do some of this work with Simon Anthony's group, at, at, um, who is now at UC Davis, looking at the evolution. But it, I think it's really quite challenging to go very far back because there's just not a lot of sequences, right? But um, it seems to make sense to us that these genetic changes in the, in the envelope protein that seem to alter the virus's susceptibility to neutralizing antibodies elicited by the vaccine, um, these, we do not believe these are, are adaptive changes that have to do with viral escape from the vaccine or from the natural immune response. We think these are older. And maybe uh, isn't this speaks to the, what you said at the very beginning, which is in order for this, this new, newly, you know, essentially yellow fever emerged in South America and Central America, and it had to adapt to a completely new sylvatic cycle with different mosquitoes and different non-human primate hosts. Um, I mean, it's, you know, I actually, again, I'm not a mosquito expert. I don't, I, I don't know the history of Aedes aegypti, did it? I mean, you know, there must have been mosquitoes that came on those ships as well, or came with people making the, the transatlantic passage. But um, so, so I don't know about that part, but it does seem to me that there was an adaptation required for the virus to be able to establish, create a new sylvatic cycle in, in the Americas. And so is it conceivable, perhaps, that the changes that we're seeing in, which, by the way, these changes are observed in almost all of the South American strains. There are some subtle differences. There are two lineages in South America, uh, uh, one and two. Um, and, you know, they have some subtle differences. But there are certain, these changes are al almost completely conserved in South American strains and only found in South American strains. They are not observed in any of the old world viruses. So we, we can't, we'll never, probably never know how this came about, but it does raise a possibility that this was an early adaptation event. Now, if we could do experiments, you know, looking at mosquito, you know, colonization and transmission with these different strains, and this is something we've talked about a lot, and this is not something we do, and we would love to find a collaborator, um, you know, to work with us on this, to really ask, you know, if we make specific mutations in the envelope protein, does that alter the uh, the capacity of the virus to colonize a particular species of mosquito versus another one, and how does that affect its ability to transmit that virus to a, a mammalian host? Right. So there could be a really fascinating story that really has to do with uh, you know viral emergence and virus host adaptation that we are not able to tell yet because we don't have the data, but we find it an intriguing possibility. Could, could you do something similar by looking at the different non-human primates um, in the different areas as well? Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, and um, right. Are there differences among, you know, different primate hosts in terms of what the kind of the viruses are that, you know, that, you know, are being transmitted to them? Are there different viruses that have different, I mean, we presume that what we're seeing in all these sequences, because uh, in addition to sequencing all these human isolates, uh, during this outbreak in Brazil, uh, NHP samples, non-human primate samples, were also sequenced. And the sequences are the same, basically. So you can sort of conclude that the viruses that are in people came from non-human primates, um, you know, most likely, right? So um, are there differences among different kinds of non-human primates? Yeah, that's what I was thinking, maybe between the, the African and the South American primates. Um, there had to be an adaptation. Uh, right, right. So they they might also be part of that picture. I mean, it could have just to do with the mosquito. It may have to do with the with the mammalian host, or it could have to do with a complex interaction between the two. And can any of those prime non-human primates serve as uh, uh, carriers without getting sick, so that uh, you know they could carry this virus for quite a long time from place to place as they migrate looking for food? Just a speculation, but and they'll have to move anyway because of the deforestation that's going on. So that shoves this whole thing around in a horrible. Yeah, way to think about I mean, it. But you have to do it. Right. This is something like we think about. Uh, we thought about a lot with hantaviruses because this is a, hantavir a lot of hantaviruses spread by road. I know this isn't that's right. this isn't about hantavirus, uh, but okay. uh, you know, there's some really <laughs> interesting human interactions uh, with the environment that, like in Brazil, for example. Uh, you know, where they're clear cutting, you know, forest and planting sugarcane yep. that essentially leads to an explosion of rodents 
Uh, and sure. those, and then there are like human caretakers, right? That are staying with the fields to protect them. And so the rodents are going into their house. And so wow. now you're getting these novel hantaviruses that have always been circulating in rodents, which get chronically infected and can carry these things for years and years. These are now p getting passed to humans through aerosol and then humans are getting really sick. So, sure. um, you know, it's these really in interesting sort of interactions that we have with our, you know, the environments in which we inhabit and the other animals and insects and plants that sure. live there. Denise, why don't you tell us, I mean, you've said that you made these monoclonals, you got this uh, South American isolate. Tell us a little bit of the detail about what you did. Okay. So, so the monoclonals we got from Adimat, from Laura Roca and Anawek. And we had like a collection of patient samples of plasma. So basically they were flavors naive. They got vaccinated with the yellow fever strain and then blood was drawn like every weeks, like up to like one to two years. And from these patients, we also got monoclonal antibodies. And what we did was very simple. We had this report of our particle system and we run neutralization assays and compared the neutralization titers, which we got for antibodies and for the patient samples. And what we saw is that for the patients, like usually if you get vaccinated, you have this peak, like at around day 10 to day 14, where you have the highest amount of IgG, IgM antibodies, like where it starts. But with the Brazilian strain, it was interesting. So we did not receive that peak and it kind of stayed low, like 10, 40, 90% decrease these neutralization titers all over. And also, as we mentioned before, the monoclonal antibodies, like certain groups of them were like really not good in neutralizing anymore. And then I reached out to Gorka and Gorka figured out some really good sites we should look into. And I introduced these mutations into our report of particle system. So what we did is we had the 7 in D, the vaccine strain, which comes from Africa and the South American Brazilian strain. And we made kind of cameras. So we interchanged first the domains to figure out, okay, which domain is more likely to be the cause of it. And then when we pin it down basically on domain two, which is this um, most central domain, which also carries diffusion loop, we found two more sites which were interesting. And one site is this kind of very uh, like well-described epitope for monoclonal antibodies which is also like this 5A antibody epitope, which was described recently. And the other side um, was a potent glycosylation site, which has not been described before. And it also wasn't on a position where you would usually see the glycosylation for Zika or Dengue. So it was in a very different position. So again, we did this kind of camera system where we just interchanged these little mutations and checked um, what's now the cause. But what was interesting is that kind of, so this epitope is not that a big of a deal that compared to the glycosylation site. So with this, the neutralization was more decreased. But if we have a combination of both sites, that's when we had the biggest effect. And also very interestingly, what also Gorka found is that there is one amino acid change after the glycosylation. I think it's a uh, listen. Yeah. Which is basically also had a, like a asparagine, change, right? asparagine for lysine. Yeah, asparagine to lysine, which also had like a impact on neutralization. So, and that's also where we then run this um, phylogenetic um, data and we figured out like which is conserved in which part for South American strains or African strains. How, how do the uh, sites that you found compare to what people had previously talked about for immunodominant epitopes? Um, maybe, uh, so on, on that question, uh, so one, one thing we did, uh, because as Denise explained, so the site one, we knew it was uh, the 5A antibody that is, probably, that is probably neutralizing. Okay, fine, we've got that site. So the question was on site two, is like, why is this site important? Uh, so there was this uh, glycan, and and then so one, so we we check on other flavies. Uh, so we we did a, a actually different things. So uh, first we run uh, B cell epitope predictions. We found that the site two, the glycan plus that 
uh, asparagine to lysine residue, th that loop was sitting on an immunogenic area. Uh, so that was one thing we did. Then we checked on, so that is a prediction. Then we check on what is known. And, um, and unfortunately, there are not many characterized epitopes on the yellow fever, but we did find some residues that were in close proximity within up to 20, 20 angstroms to the glycosylation site. So uh, if you imagine a big glycan moving around, it's like, well, maybe there are some steady clashes uh, uh, and that hinders binding there. And then finally, what we did is we went to the PDB and we checked on um, uh, crystal structures on what the flay is and what are the, where the antibodies are binding. And we found multiple antibodies in other flavies that bind, would aesthetically collapse with this sugar. Uh, but the, the interesting thing is that no antibodies reported yet to bind where we find that this uh, and, uh, amino acid change on site two. So we had to use all the knowledge from different flavies to yes. suggest that uh, this is an immunogenic site. And I can add a couple of things. So first, just to follow up on what they both said, um, there aren't a lot of isolated antibodies for yellow fever. You know, yellow fever is, you know, in recent years, much less studied than dengue and Zika and, you know, other flavies that are, you know, of course, you know, uh, have been intensively studied, um, so, uh, especially with all of the modern tools of antibody isolation. So we don't actually have a lot of monoclonal antibodies. And this is one of the reasons why the work that Laura Walker and Anna's work was, you know, that we contributed to was very important because they identified a lot of monoclonal antibodies. But, you know, it's tricky because um, you have to, the antibodies you get, you know, are totally dependent on the kind of fish you catch when you go fishing is totally dependent on the kind of bait you use, right? And in that case, the, the bait that they used was a monomeric, well, what turns out to be mostly a monomeric E protein and not this highly organized particle that has these dimers that are organized in these rafts. And so they put out a lot of antibodies that bound to parts of the E protein that are also seen for other flaviviruses in the human antibody response, like the fusion loop that's pretty hydrophobic and conserved, tends to elicit a lot of antibodies. But those antibodies in general are crappy neutralizers. They don't really neutralize infection that well. Um, and they also pulled out domain three antibodies, which are much less common in the response, but also quite strongly, like strong epitopes to neutralize, strong neutralizing antibodies. But in fact, if you look at Sera from from people right that have gotten the vaccine, which Denise did, and this is like a big part of the study, uh, our follow up study. Um, the bulk of the neutralizing antibody response uh, in uh, upon vaccination, we think, is really driven by uh, antibodies that actually bind to the particle and only bind to the particle, and not necessarily to these isolated monomeric proteins. And this is something that you know that. Others have seen for yellow fever, others have seen for other uh, other flaviviruses, these highly conformational structured quaternary epitopes on particles, um, you know, are, are very, very important. And what Denise showed um, uh, and Gorka is that these mutations that they identified seem to be selectively affecting that particular subset of antibodies, you know, which, you know, which really contributes a huge percentage of the neutralizing response, quantitatively speaking. And that's why we see these huge differences with the, with the CIRA between, um, you know, if, if you take the Brazilians and U.S. donors, vaccinate them with a very similar vaccine, and then we, we draw their blood, and then we look at the serum neutralizing activity of that, of, of that blood against either the African virus or the South American virus, we see that the same results with both cohorts, which is that, the neutralizing activity is much less against the South American virus, even though we know, you know, that this vaccine elicits lots of neutralizing antibodies that bind to the monomer, what is actually neutralizing in people that get viral, like a live attenuated virus vaccine, are these, it appears, these quaternary binding antibodies. And I mean, if you look at papers in the literature from Gavin Screeton, Felix Ray, uh, David Fremont, like all of the, uh, you know, uh, folks that are doing uh, Richard Kuhn, like doing all these flavy structures bound to antibodies, those antibody, a lot of these antibodies are binding 
across sites of symmetry on the particle to these conformational epitopes. And that's what we think is happening in our case, except we have not identified any such antibodies for yellow fever yet, and nobody has. Um, and so Gorka's work is really kind of a first step using structural modeling and computational biology to try and think about where such antibodies might be. But ultimately, I think one of our next steps um, and others in the field is to go and find such uh, antibodies. And finding those antibodies is hard because you have to have the right bait to find those antibodies, or you have to do a brute force thing where you just find gazillion antibodies and then just look for the ones that bind to the intact particle. So it becomes really a biochemistry problem to try and solve. And that's something that uh, Denise is working on and a student in my lab, uh, Alex, is, is also now going to be working on, or is working on that. But so, could, could, you, yeah. could you just use virus instead of that, that's protein. exactly right. That's that's what we want to do. Either yeah. actual virus or um, virus or, or like virus mimetic particles, uh, like yeah, virus-like yeah. particles yeah. that have the same organization. And we also want to actually look and see what are the specificities of the antibodies in the in the serum. Uh, you know, so of course we could fish out antibodies by fishing out B cells, but you know we want to look at the um, the antibodies in the serum in situ, so to speak, to understand. And now there are all these really cool tools with proteomics as well as structural approaches to actually deconvolute polyclonal antibody sera. And so this is another sort of approach that we're, we're trying to, to take. To so Vincent, out. I remember my question. Okay. And um, it goes back to the origins of this vaccine. As far as I understand, this is the oldest antiviral vaccine and it was what developed in the 1930s by serial passage through animals. Yeah. Max so it Tyler. attenuated yeah. to the point where you could inject a live virus, a live or an active replicating virus that doesn't cause disease but induces immunity. So, could you go back to the uh, the viral manufacturers of this vaccine to the very beginning? I'm sure they've got stored samples of the virus someplace, and. Go down that line all the way to the present. Are you going to find any difference between the virus that was the original vaccine candidate to the one that we're now using? So are, the, are there differences? The original, the original one is, is, is this a CV strain, which was this African patient from which they isolated the, the virus. And then from this, they best search and they really got the 17D. And I don't think, like, I only um, checked the E protein. For differences, there are not that many. I see. So, and then from the 17D, you receive those substrains where you have the vaccine, like um, 17 dd 17 d 204 but they all have just like one or two more amino acid changes in the right. protein. So it's a commonly used vaccine, right? In order to travel, you have to have your yellow fever vaccine. Right. Yeah. Are there any recorded outbreaks of yellow fever which resulted as a result of the vaccine that they gave those people looked good, but when they received that particular strain of yellow fever in the wild, they all got sick. Did that ever happen? Um, not, I, I guess I'm not sure, but are you asking if the vaccine essentially like reverted and became No, no not the vaccine. Oh. They encountered a strain of the virus that didn't match up with the vaccine. <laughs> and I, then they got I sick. Don't. I don't. I I'm not aware of any such no. because this is a, this is a really yeah. stable virus, then, right? Yeah, those, I mean there are differences, genes. right? There are. I mean, it's important to, to to the to the point you made initially. It's it's important to sort of point out that this is a family of vaccines because it's a live attenuated vaccine. vaccine okay. Because it's been split and passage in different places. So, for example, the Brazilian the 17 DD virus has, you know, some amino acid changes relative to the 204, as Denise mentioned. So um, those don't seem to fundamentally alter the, the response, uh, you know, in terms of the types of antibodies that are elicited. Although it has to be said, has anyone, I, I think we sort of just kind of, you know, happen to be looking at these cohorts of Americans, U.S. and Brazilian donors that were getting these two different flavors of the vaccine. Uh, but it's, we can't say there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, but Overall, the responses seem to be to be quite similar. I'm not sure. I, I'm not familiar. There are cases of people getting the vaccine getting really sick. I mean, it's quite rare. But um, I'm not familiar with any well-documented 
situation where a whole bunch of people got a vaccine and it was completely ineffective. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, it's perhaps the South American outbreak that you talk about at the beginning of this paper um, <laughs> maybe has a small component or a partial component. I guess I can't really give it any fractions. Um that is re partially related to this mismatch is, I guess, what I took a little bit from your paper. Yeah, I mean, it's possible. I, I think one of the real challenges is, like, um, that we've kind of come up, like, encountered is, what is the true, what, you know, we say in the paper, people say, you know, and it's said that neutralizing antibody response is a correlate of protection, right? Okay, so A, that's probably an oversimplification. B, quantitatively, what does that mean, right? Like how much neutralizing activity do you actually need in order to protect somebody from acquiring yellow fever, right? I mean, this is the same old conversation we're having with COVID and, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, and it's maybe different because this is a mosquito-borne infection where maybe the inoculum sizes are not that big. And, uh, you know, maybe you don't actually need a lot of neutralizing antibody that's circulating because in, in, in COVID, you know, whatever is, is sort of the, the the circulating antibodies have to get into the lungs, have to get into the respiratory space. So we know that you need a lot of antibody there to kind of get enough to cross over to block sort of the primary infections in the respiratory tract, right? So it makes sense that if your circulating antibody wanes because there's a time lag, because there isn't that much antibody in the respiratory tract, you are going to have some symptoms. You may not get really sick. You may not end up in the hospital. But but how does that relate to yellow fever where the mosquito is essentially injecting virus into your blood? Like, is that, uh, you know, in that case, maybe you actually need a lot less neutralizing antibody. And this is the million dollar question. There are some, everybody cites like this one paper where they did these serial experiment, like inoculation, like, like dosing studies in non-human primates. But I, you know, that's an old paper and it, it's not, it's an important paper, but I wouldn't say that it's conclusive in establishing a minimal amount of neutralizing activity that's needed to confer protection. Um, so the question we always grapple with is we do see a difference in neutralizing activity, but is that difference in neutralizing activity sufficient to, to contribute to reduce vaccine effectiveness uh, today? What will happen 10 years from now? You know, and in what about the edge cases where somebody got the vaccine 25 years ago and maybe now they're like developing some other like you know uh, you know immune suppressed sort of phenotype or maybe they're on chemo or something i don't know like is there a set of circumstances where this mismatch between the vaccine strain and the circulating virus is going to cause a problem in some people and what are the terms of those problems and what are the circumstances in which they arise i think this is a question from a real world sort of perspective we would like the answer to the one thing we are saying and the one thing we say in the paper is what can be stated confidently is if you're using neutralizing antibody titers, the way you're measuring them, which is using the vaccine strain as the indicator virus to measure those, those responses, you are systematically overestimating the neutralizing antibody response in South Americans, right? Because we know for a fact that those viruses that are circulating in South America are less susceptible to the, the circulating neutralizing antibody response, right? Maybe that reduced level is enough, but it is less than what, you know, is stated based on those measurements. So maybe if you did nothing else, you would at least revisit how you measure. The, if you're going to do serological surveys on people and measure neutralizing antibody responses, you ought to think about changing the indicator strain. I mean, I think minimal in South America. So I would say minimally, that's something to think about. Mm -hmm. To uh, match to match the South to, American to match virus, the virus yeah. that's in, circulating. But I, I think the vaccine effectiveness question is a really hard one. But you know, he, I mean, with to to make an analogy with SARS-CoV-2. So mm. you know, you're twice vaccinated. Omicron, your serum does not neutralize Omicron, but if you get boosted now, it will because you do further antibody maturation. So maybe we just need two not fractionated doses of yellow fever vaccine to take care of these changes, right? Oh, well, yeah. Yes. It could very well be. Yeah. Brianne, does that make sense, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Sorry. I, I have to say that 
my mind is still blown by the concept that with a vaccine like this that has been around for such a long time and is sort right. of talked about in so many ways as an you know immunological gold standard yeah, of a very yeah. effective vaccine that we don't know things about the epitopes. Correct. I, I, that, so, that honestly like blew my mind and my mind will be blown for the rest of the day. I don't think we know the correlates of protection really, right? Not really. We don't know if it's, I mean, you, you. Not completely, anyway. Yeah. I could, I'll bet T cells play an important role, right? But yeah, nobody's I, probably that looking I agree. at that. Yeah. Um, but in this case, so you've, and let me just summarize you've got two changes that seem to account together for the reduced uh, neutralization activity of convalescent sera, of post vaccine sera, correct? You have yes. no idea whether those changes are <laughs> causing uh, quote unquote vaccine. This failure in South America, right? No That's idea. Correct. That's correct. okay. It, it also blew our minds that there were these changes that that we found these changes that they've been hiding in plain sight for decades, right? Maybe from the very, very beginning. Absolutely. It's hard to believe also that yeah. nobody found them, right? So the the yeah. glycan was actually uh, found computationally in 1995, but just it was just described as there is a glycan, but uh, not so even we, in all the strains, just in like a couple of sequences. There was not a, a systematic phylogenetic analysis of all of the strains that was done. Um, and this, this other mutation that's right next to the, the glycan, which is just an N to K change, yeah. you know. And, yeah, and, and you know, you can read any number of reviews that say E protein from yellow fever virus, unlike many other flaviviruses, is, is not glycosylated, right? And it turns out that the South American one is, and it isn't some new emerging strain. This thing is probably goes back to the beginning. So in South America. Yeah. So what's the? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Denise. Go ahead. I, I I also one thing we found which I found very interesting. So we did um, some tests on this glycosidation site with like a very simple PNGSF digestion, and both us and Muna Bonanno's lab we found that the particles were not completely glycosylated, or we have two subsets of particles glycosylated or not. So we were also wondering what that would mean actually, like. That could have further implications on how maybe the structure of the particle is going to look like. And maybe this is why some antibodies cannot bind. So is there uh, any way in vaccine production that you can be sure that proper glycosylation is actually happening if there is any ha glycosylation happening on the vaccine strain? Or is that, the, that because it's an African strain, there's no glycosylation on E, as you mentioned? There is no glycosylation. Okay. No, no. The on, we only find glycosylation among South Americans. Okay. And, and, and just what, to be precise on one thing, so we have the side two mutations, that is, one is the glycosylation, and, and the other one that we mentioned is that asparagine to lysine, uh, that is right under the glycan. And uh, what is super interesting that I find is that if we deconvolute these two sites and we test just the glycan, we observe a loss in neutralization. Uh, so without the glycan, we increase neutralization. Okay, so that's consistent what we found. But if we don't have a glycan and, and we mutate the residue on, on that is below the glycan that we didn't expect this residue to do any role because it's like, well, we have a big glycan, we have an umbrella, we have our, our explanation. But that second residue actually also changes even more dramatically uh, neutralization. So now what's going on? We, we, that we don't know. There, there are complexities there in terms of, we actually think that one of the more fascinating things that lot, you know, that number of folks have in the Flavi field have been working on is this idea that the particle is dynamic. And, and, you know, there's a lot of work on this uh, from, uh, from many people. Uh, and I'm, I'm blanking on a um, person at the NIH that Ted did Pearson. a lot of this. Ted Pearson. Uh, Ted Pearson, but, uh, but also, I, I'm really bad with names. The scientist in Singapore, Shimei Locke, right? Like, Shimei Locke. There's a number of, yeah, so a number of Flavy researchers have been on to this idea. Felix Ray, you know, we talked to him a lot about this. The idea that the particles are dynamic and that they're breathing, quote unquote, and uh, and the amount of breathing depends on the sequence and it depends on the specific virus you're talking about, dengue versus West Nile versus yellow fever. And none of that's really been looked at for yellow fever. And so one idea that we've been banging around that we would love to validate biochemically, structurally, and maybe even computationally is that uh, these changes we're seeing aren't necessarily only affecting 
antibodies that are binding to those specific sites, but are rather causing these more global shifts in the breathing of the virus that are somehow affecting binding by other antibodies binding to distant sites. So at the moment, this is all just hand waving or particle waving, but you know, we hope to put some meat on these bones. What is yeah. the situation with animal models? Is there something that you could use to test uh, any of this? I mean, the gold standard model is non-human primates. Um, uh, it's too bad. But you it's could do, I think there are, you know, there are rodent models, so you could do things. Because you could immunize with yeah. with the, the, the 17DD mm -hmm. and then come in with the uh, Brazilian isolate and see, uh, you know, and see if you give yeah. multiple doses. Does it get a, Does it get around the issue? Is there an issue? I mean, that's worth doing, right? It is. It is. And we're, we're you know, we need to get money to do some of these things and we're, they doing the usual academic thing of trying to write grants, but yeah, yeah, but but no, sure. certainly I think these are important experiments. Um, yeah, In I would also day, say. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I just, I, you know, I was dealing with not similar problems than you guys, but because I was working on a worm that was much larger and had more you know, antigens and a like, more complicated life cycle. Although you wouldn't argue that way, I'm sure, <clears throat> because viruses are very complicated. But I, I would have. I would suggest an approach that used the virus particle as an immunoabsorbent column attachment and take the 70% of the sera that, which would come from people who survived that outbreak because it's got a 30% mortality rate, right? So you, and then isolate the IgG fraction, th throw it through the column, and then do two things. One is elude it off the column after you've done it and see whether or not you've got a plaque assay that you could actually inhibit the viral replication from. But the other thing is you could use cryo-EM to actually, on the whole virus, show where those antibodies actually were sticking. And if you found yeah. a symmetry to that, you might have some good clues. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're onto something. I, we haven't thought about doing that with like, <laughs> people that succumb or survive, but... What we would like to do is to take sera from vaccinees and do exactly what you're proposing, which is to essentially fish out. Um, well, first to do, uh, and now there are, you know, Andrew Ward among others has, you know, developed yeah. some really elegant approach where you can use high resolution cryo to start to map epitopes um, in this kind of setting that you're talking about. With yeah, serum, from serum. With yeah. That blows me away. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so we would love to get some of that. And uh, yeah. and I think there are proteomic approaches too, right? Where you could do exactly what you're saying. Use particles yeah. differentially as baits uh, to, to sort of fish out what you look for. And of course, if you're sorting B cells so at the level of B cell receptors, depending on how you design your baits, you could do something similar. So yeah. there's, there's uh, you know, there's a lot to do there to really try and define the basis of these responses. And then, of course, trying to figure out what that means in terms of disease pathogenesis and, you know, vaccines and epidemiology is like a whole well, other then you could afford the non-human primate part of it if you could guarantee that, almost guarantee, that the uh, fraction that you isolated and it's absolutely ironclad that prevents plaque formation would also save the lives of those animals. And you could say, well, they're going to get it in nature anyway, so let's use some in a, you know, in a um, primate facility that I presume that there are some in South America. Yeah. There are and they're studying this, they're they're studying well. this. That's yeah. right. Yeah, I have to say we haven't, we've thought a lot about the next steps in terms of the molecular biology, but we we need to do more to sort of embiggen the scope of the way we're thinking, you know, with, with the kind of experiments you're talking about. And I think going into some kind of animal studies or even mosquito, you know, yeah. colonization, transmission studies would be really, really interesting. And so just need to start to develop those the problem is project. there's We're collaborators so. there's never enough money to do the science that needs to be done yeah, that's, that's right the problem. that is right i mean we science is woefully underfunded and people don't get it even after a pandemic they still don't get it right Probably don't. the politicians don't get it because unfortunately this it's congress that has to allocate the money and it's just not that's enough right. i mean right. 40 billion for the nih is nothing it's nothing, especially since most of it goes to HIV and influenza virus, you know. Vincent, we need you to run for president. No, no, no. Yeah. I don't need to run for president. I can be an advocate, though. I can be an evangelist. That's what TWIV is. It's an evangelist, basically, for 
Well, if, if you can't convince people to invest in virology now, I don't know if when we're ever going to be able to do it, right? And it's true that there are these, like there is a lot more specific funding, um, you know, for these very targeted therapeutic and vaccine development things. But, you know, I, I think that this project is an example of something that happened through just serendipity, um, inquiring minds wanting to know, and, you know, <laughs> people in the lab poking around asking questions. And, uh, you know, and I feel like, you you know, I don't know, like you can't really put a dollar amount on that, right? That, And, and how do you even try oh, to get yeah. money to do something like that? You have to get money to do A and then use it to do B. And that's no, usually a, how this I mean, goes. You know, the yeah. assumption is made that you're going to try other things. When you get an NIH yeah, yeah. grant, you can try other stuff. That's absolutely Which I love fine. about the NIH, right? Yeah. And that's not always something with that's other true. funding mechanisms is, is easy to yeah. do. So the NIH does does support that. But you are not you are not suggesting that we need to make a new vaccine, are you, for South America? I think that would be premature. It would also be irresponsible because it would be – we have a vaccine – uh, the last thing we want to do is make people confused or make them not want to get the existing vaccine. When we know that, in fact, the vaccine does work, um, may, you know, could it work better? Could we modernize it? Could we do things? Yes. And we should be trying to do all of that. But the things we need to be doing right now is figuring out how to make a lot more of the existing vaccine to get it into arms um, because we'll save a lot of lives doing that. And then the argument this becomes, can we, what can we do about the future? And we got to work on the future, but we also can't like, we should do the thing that's immediately expedient and available. I mean, you can have the world's greatest drug, right? But like if, you know, it's going to take us or vaccine, it's going to take us like 10 years, 15 years to develop it and get it to the point where it can be approved. And then, People are going to argue about how to manufacture and who owns the patent. And, you know, in the meantime, we've got this vaccine that Max Saylor helped to make in 1930s. It still works and we need to, to cover the world with it. Right. And then we can worry about the future as we go. But so I would certainly be the last person to suggest that, you know, uh, Den Denise, look what yeah. you did. <laughs> She's what? still there. She are you there? Look what, you, there? Look, what you, look what you started. I'm saying, look what you started. I mean, you, you brought this yellow fever project and now look at where he's going with it. <laughs> that's good. She's that's how science works, right? But I, I yeah, want to well, that's to the way. About, about the vaccine. I mean, we have a shortage and we're still producing the vaccine yeah. so much similar than 1937 in X. And I did see a lot of papers where they are making them in viral cells and it works really well. So maybe why not? Modern, like making a more modern vaccine in regards of production? Because with the, are, well, aren't, there, aren't people having side effects also with vaccines from X, like getting allergy reactions and things like that? I don't think so. I think that's, uh, that, you know, for influenza virus, I don't think that that's it. Even though we have switched, we have started to make some cell-based vaccines. I really, I, I looked at the data. There was a review article on it, which concluded there really isn't mm -hmm. any egg-based reactivity. The problem is that okay. it's very easy to grow viruses and eggs. And in cells, you have to have huge fermenters, which, I mean, Peter Palazzi tells me they get contaminated all the time. You have to throw it out. Or it's hard to do. Okay. It's very hard to do. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, along along those lines, I mean, I'm just, just going to get back on my soapbox. Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. I yeah. totally got it. Yeah. No, but, but I think more generally, like this is something we're confronting with Prometheus. Like we have this amazing hantavirus antibody, right? And now we have to, A, figure out how to do all the preclinical stuff, non-human primate studies, get it to phase one. All of that takes money. But that's doable, right, with the NIH's help, with other agencies. But then, you know, if you look at something like yellow fever or hantavirus, like where are these outbreaks actually happening, right? They're not happening stateside. They're happening in, you know, like Brazil is a relatively resource-rich country and they can, they can manufacture the vaccine. But if you look at... Um, you know, where all of this kind of ma manufacturing happens. It happens in very few places. And so if we could only figure out how to decentralize, you know, like we were having this conversation with our collaborators in Chile and like, and Chile is, is like a, is a quote unquote first world nation, right? Like, it, I mean, it's a developed country and they don't actually have a, they don't have uh, uh, um, uh, facilities to make, to manufacture GMP grade material for like monoclonal antibodies, right? So like everything has to come from somewhere else. 
So I think one of the problems, which is really frustrating, is you can be the world's best virologist or molecular biologist, and you can make these amazing vaccines and antibodies, but if you can't get it that last like 50 miles, that last 100 miles, and you can't solve the problem of manufacturing, cold chain, distribution, then you might as well not have these things. I mean, I, I know that like we... We feel like it's not our problem to solve, but I think we kind of have to make it our problem because if all these countries in Africa could have their own, and I, maybe I'm maybe there's some of this already happened or is happening. I'm not totally up on this, but if we could decentralize manufacturing for biologics, be they vaccines or antibodies, then I think that would go a long way towards solving some of these availability problems. You know, there's back, there's like intellectual property issues and all that, but that can all be sorted, right? Like, I mean, you can come up with licensing agreements uh, by negotiating on behalf of large, like what Bill Clinton and all of that, you know, how, what was done for HIV can be, could be done for a lot of these other things. So to me, this is like a huge issue that goes beyond the kind of things that we think about in the lab. Of course. Of like, course. But, you know, yeah. and to a certain extent, the COVID vaccines have started to address that. I mean, some companies are trying to build production capacity in other countries. I think the, uh, um, the AstraZeneca, they, they had, I think Sarah Gilbert told me they have, you know, 15 different countries they're bringing online capabilities and that's good. And okay. hopefully but what that, happens after COVID? That's over? the problem. You can't just turn it off and, and let it sit there. You have to, <laughs> has to yeah, keep but you going. could use it to make, you know, yeah. some other antibody. You could use it to make, uh, Biologics for breast cancer, right? Like it, it doesn't have, sure. you could use it to make TNF and antibodies. You don't have to. So, so you know. Kartik, this is, this is the world's problem, right? We have, the whole world has to participate, but they don't want to. They, most countries want to just deal with their own stuff and they don't want to help anyone else. And I don't think that works in, in public health. I think we should be doing more than we do, not just giving vaccines, but to help build capacity, right? But you're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah, it's a problem. And also, I, I think like the like Asia also has Aedes aegypti, and they kind of were already worried that yellow fever would spread over there. There are also now first yellow fever yeah. cases in Argentina, and like the the chance is there for further immigration of the virus. Mm. So would yeah. make sense. Yep, for sure. Oh, by the way, um, do you think really a yellow fever is the oldest? What about Smallpox vaccine, that's pretty old, right? That was a scarification, correct? Well, it doesn't matter what it is. It's a vaccine, no, no, right? It, well, this is a, a, a laboratory-based you know. vaccine. But didn't they also do this thing where they, like, took the stuff and, like, blew it into people's lungs? Right. Well, so that was variolation, yeah. which was done right. with the, the the human virus, right? But the Jenner right. thing was oh, to I use right, right. cowpox or horsepox, and um, yeah, which yeah, is no, naturally attenuated. So he didn't have to passage it because he didn't know anything about viruses anyway. That's true. But that's true. so it's a, I think you could say that that's the first vaccine. That's okay. the oldest vaccine. Just to be, because otherwise we're going to get email about that. You, know? <laughs> well, you get them anyway, so that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Oh, anyway, this has been a great conversation. Anything else? We, we need to touch that we didn't, do you think, Kartik and Denise and Gorka? I, I guess I sort of wonder what you all think is the next set of experiments that you want to do on this, <laughs> at least in terms of the molecular. We've talked about the big picture places that this can go, but where do you want to go with the molecular parts of this? Um, I, I want well, to decomvolute those two those two sites, uh, the glycan and uh, and the lysine, and find out what is happening there. Yeah, yeah. we want to find out what's happening to particles that allows them to resist mm -hmm. these antibodies. Yeah, and we want to go find the antibodies, and you know that that are responsible for so much of this this difference in activity, and do the experiments that that uh, you know. That, do the experiments that Dixon is suggesting. So, I also want to figure out what this glycan is doing because it's atypical. Like, what are you doing there? It's like, what's your job? And we'd love to do this. These just this idea that these changes are were, you know, I don't know that we could test them explicitly, but we'd love to get to this notion that um, these changes are somehow responsible for viral adaptation to a new cytolytic cycle. But that kind of goes beyond, you know, our abilities and even, I think, you know, I, we're going to need 
amazing collaborators. But you know, I think that we've had amazing collaborators on this project and on Prometheus and many other projects that we work on. So that's just one of our next steps. My next step is always to find somebody smarter than me to help with experiments. So that's what I'm going to work on. Good strategy. I like that. All right. That is uh, a lovely discussion. And let me thank you guys. Karthik Chandran, all of you, Einstein College of Medicine. Karthik Chandran, thanks so much for coming back. Thank you for having us. Denise Hasselvanter, thank you so much. Thank you. And good luck in your next uh, step. <laughs> thanks. And uh, Gorka Cabrera, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I guess you're going to be in New York for a while, right? I will, yes. Yeah, I felt like I was back in the lab. <laughs> a different lab. Where am I? What's happening to me? <laughs> a conversations, yeah. All right, I think um, we have to go right to picks because I got to sure. twiv with Daniel at five. I don't want to. You got it. Make him wait because he's out of town. So let's do some picks. Dixon, what do you have this I've week? I've got a double pick for you that you'll just love. One is the uh, current celebration of Earth Day, which is half over. And um, the other is a history of the Earth Day. It began in 1970. Uh, there was a senator from Wisconsin by the name of Nelson, <clears throat> who right in the middle of the protests to the Vietnam War um, with pollution rampant. Um, apparently no one cared what was going on because they were all being politicized by this horrible, um, horrible misrepresentation of facts that got the American public hooked on supporting the Vietnam War rather than questioning it. Um, Nelson didn't bend under those conditions and we ought to concentrate our efforts on the earth. And established Earth Day, and I remember when that occurred. I was um, on my way to Columbia at that point. I was um, <clears throat> at uh, Rockefeller, and um, actually, I was out. I was in um, Ohio, and that's the job I took to begin with, which I didn't like. Which I then switched mm -hmm. to Columbia, which I lived a happy life ever after. <laughs> Not really, but that's the way it should sound. Um, <laughs> Uh, right, not without lumps and bumps. But these two um, websites will fill you in as to what the meaning of Earth Day really is. And frankly, every day should be Earth Day. I mean, that's the whole deal. <clears throat> Why have one? <clears throat> Pardon me. Hang on. Mm -hmm. Why have just one day as Earth Day when you can have 365 days as Earth Day? Or one day that's not Earth Day, take time off. And, but for the rest of your life, you know, this is your only home. Why are we degrading it so offhandedly? Because people you know, want money. That's I all people I care about. That. But people are making money, making it better now. The use of alternative energy resources. Um, there's a lot of other things going on that look as though economically speaking you won't have a you won't have a choice to, to make because you'll make the right decision based on economics that also does the right thing for the planet and that's hopefully, where all these renewable stuffs are heading and, yes, I and hopefully hope listeners, listeners today also thought about things like all of the ways that conservation could have stopped some of these uh, sylvatic and uh, domestic Absolutely. cycles that we talked about. And hopefully, so hopefully they noticed those tie-ins between Earth Day um, and in fact, these infections uh, that we have been talking about earlier. What, yellow fever can be eliminated by environmental intervention. Forget about vaccines. You don't need them as long as you, well, forget it. Anyway, that's there, my there are There are multiple examples of how Ecological disruptions lead to spillover, the Argentine no hemorrhagic question. fever, you know, no the question. trashing of the Pampas, the, uh, the the outbreak of Nipah in Malaysia was because we were deforesting yeah. and we, yeah, we kicked right. the bats out of their natural habitat. So they went that's to right. the big that's farms. Right. That's right. That's I mean, right. we do it over and over. We do. Because people would like to make money. And they don't think about conservation. You know, recently people said we should just burn coal until we don't have it anymore, which is the worst <laughs> thing in the world. But it's all cheap to do and you make a lot of money for the companies. So people have to get out of this mindset. But there are many people who just don't care. All they need is 
You're right. You know, to get to the next day, it's You're hard right. enough for them. I understand that. And and the earth's problems are really second to their problems, right? So yeah. that's what we have to contend with. It's true. Unfortunately. And I don't think it'll it'll change. Now, Dixon, every other day of the year has some other day named, you know, there's true. a polio day, there's a trichinella day and everything. There, there is. Oh, now you tell me. <laughs> well, I don't know, actually, but there are many days. There's there a rabies day and everything. So we have to have those too. And that's why. And anyway, if you have one day a year, it's more special, right? It sorry, it draws your attention to all the issues, but then we rapidly forget them when other issues take precedent over the ones that we just heard about. And that's like Ukraine and the inflation rate and these horrible people that are thinking of running for Congress again. It's maddening. That's all yeah. I can say. It's that's why we talk about viruses here. That's right. They're uniformly Re pathogenic. Is that no? That's not right either. No, <laughs> no most of them are not. In fact, most that's of them right. are that's quite right. harmless. Brian, what do you have for us? So I have an XKCD comic that came out earlier this week and made me laugh. Um, it shows a uh, sort of gathering of some individuals, um, and. Um, they're labeled. Uh, and at the bottom, it says, really, every gathering is a family reunion. And it points out that one person is me and one person is second cousin. And one is 12th cousin and one is 14th cousin and one is 9th cousin and one is 35th cousin. And even the cat is 17 millionth cousin. And even the plant, the house plant is 50 billionth cousin. Um, mm -hmm. And right. I, I really thought that that was a, a fun way of kind of thinking about that, that, you know, everything you're doing is really just a family reunion. Last universal common ancestor. Yep, yes. Luca. We're all derived from Luca. Exactly. <laughs> That's a good point. I like that. Um, so my pick is a DVD, and it's a DVD because I couldn't find it any other way, called Tokaido, A Journey. Now, uh, we we bought this. I don't even remember, years ago. I think my wife bought it because our son was into Japan and of course he never looked at it. I just found it the other day and it is a lovely DVD. It, so the Tokaido was a road between Edo, which is the old name of Tokyo and Kyoto, which was the capital at the time. And you could travel this road. Now this is in the era of the shogunate you know, where the shoguns controlled uh, Japan. Uh, they eventually got kicked out and we got they got into the modern era. But during that time, you could go along this road. You had to, you could stop. There were 53 stations along the road where you could stop and rest and so forth. Um, and this DVD, a Belgian filmmaker, um, so uh, to, to finish the story, in 1832, the artist uh, um, Hiroshige uh, traveled this road. It's uh, 300 miles. And, you know, you walk it. There are no cars, right? <laughs> you walk it or you have a horse or whatever. Uh, they would take, take people in those carriages, you know. Um, and he wanted to see if it was like it used to be, if there was anything left. Because uh, Hiroshige had made 53 sketches, one for each stations. And actually there's a couple of extra at either end. And so the Belgian filmmaker wanted to know, can I find any of these? Is there anything left of that era uh, in the sketches? So he goes to each station and I think there's 20 different 20 minute segments uh, here. And um, he doesn't find much, right? <laughs> Because it's all modernized and the trees are gone and he can, he'll, he'll take one of the prints and you, you have seen these traditional Japanese prints where Beautiful, very, very bright colors, very yes. clean lines, you know, very little <laughs> shading right. and so forth. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and uh, he sometimes finds things and sometimes he can't find anything. And sometimes he thinks, well, Hiroshige must have imagined this because, you know, he wasn't even there at the right time of year. So it's a, it's a very entertaining, uh, journey. But at the end, he says, you know, what still remains are the people. And that's the most interesting aspect of any road are the people that inhabit the road. And he met many, many people who, you know, he would get into taxis and they would tell him about what, where to find this. And that. It was, it's very, very interesting and uh, entertaining. And 
you know, after the shogunate, so, so unfortunately, uh, Hiroshige died, I think of tuberculosis, not too soon afterwards. Um, and then of course the, sh the shogunate fell and they, then Japan opened up to the world and the world began to see Hiroshige's art, which they'd never seen before. And many artists like Picasso and, and others were blown away and used that as inspiration that they'd never seen anything like this uh, at all. And um, you can see s traces of uh, his art. So the DVD is a lot of fun. Um, you can also go and find a Wikipedia page where the, they'll show you the 53 uh, pieces that he did. I mean, he I think he sketched and then he went back to Edo and... Uh, he, that's where he actually painted them because there are wood cuts. They were very complicated to make, you know, the different woods with different paints and so forth. But I found it just totally fascinating. Um, <laughs> our, our son who we bought this for actually came and watched a few. And I said, what did you think? And he said, well, I wish they had a bigger budget so they could have used more music because they used the oh. same music in every episode. <laughs> he oh, was complaining oh, about that, but it's really fun. And um, I learned a lot. I didn't know that this, was a thing, right? And, um, you know, history is a lot of fun. So Tokaido, a journey. Uh, it's probably, you can probably find it somewhere else, but um, I, I have this DVD and so I just found a link to it, which I'll put in the show notes. Cool. Uh, Wikipedia. Nice. Okay, uh, we have a listener pick from Beth who uh, sends a link uh, to a, a YouTube uh, video called Strand Beast Evolution 2021. The Beach Beast. We ran across this vid video of these fantastic wind driven sculptures right after watching the latest TWIV. And I thought they are a great listener pick. A superb combination of engineering, study of biological forms, physics, craft, and art. Wouldn't it be fantastic to be hanging out at the beach when one of these comes <laughs> trembling by? So, this is our, these are amazing. I don't know what you would call them. They're like machines, right? They're moving and they're, they have struts. Whirly gigs. They're called whirly gigs. Yeah. Uh, this guy built them. It's moving along. I guess the wind is powering the movement to a certain right. extent. Right. It looks like is the there? wind is powering the movement, but that's, that's quite the, oh my gosh, this <laughs> video of the ones moving. That's amazing. Yeah. One, and one other one looks like a caterpillar or something like that. It's quite interesting. Thanks very much for TWIV still keeping us sane. If someone had told me in 2019 that watching TWIV in all its formats would be a weekly must-watch in our household, I would have laughed. But here we are. Oh, so many people said, seriously? A podcast on viruses? Come on. I mean, they made fun of it, right? And here we are, Beth. Thank you. Beth is from Seattle. P.S. Nothing to do with my pick, but just an observation from a local. I live under flight lines for both of our medical helipads. I hear the medical choppers overhead several times an hour during every big surge. Uh, I heard the medical choppers when it is normally a couple of times a week. Felt like a war zone mid-Omicron. I read somewhere that the medical service area for Seattle and Environs covers 78,000 square miles in five wow. states. If you re get really sick in Idaho, you wind up in Spokane or Seattle. Same for Alaska and Montana and Oregon where Portland is overwhelmed. Right. I heard Rich puzzling over Washington's high death rate. It's probably at least partly because people are flown in from other states just when they are most likely to have serious illness and die. Hospitalizations and deaths are recorded where people die, not where they came from. I imagine Denver, Salt Lake, San Antonio, and Minneapolis serve as similar service basins for neighboring rural areas and states with low vaccination rates and limited medical facilities. Oh boy. You'd go all the way from Alaska to Washington in a helicopter? That's amazing. <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad I live in this area where we we can stay here if we get sick, right? Mm -hmm. We can die where we want. <laughs> That's TWIV 893. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send us a question, a comment, a pic. You can tell us how TWIV has helped you. That's <laughs> and right. that you can't believe you're listening to a virus podcast. Yeah, that's, that's you just, you have to be surprised in life. Open your minds, right? 
And it's not just about viruses. <laughs> no, there are other pods as well. We do wonder. Well. We do wonder. Yeah, that too. And twivitmicrobe.tv, that's the email. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us. We depend on your support. You can go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. And there are a number of ways you can donate. And your donations are federal U.S. tax deductible. We are a nonprofit. Dixon Depommier is at trichinella.org and thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. This was, once again, a fun time. And I actually transported myself back to the lab for about 15 seconds. <laughs> so that was a good feeling. Good. Glad you liked it. I thought you I would did. like yellow fever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And no, I love it. It's one of my favorites. Brianne Barker is at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.